I know everybody is, is very busy and thank you for taking your time from your busy schedule to come and listen and hopefully it will be worth your while. Uh, this is part of a series of lectures that we're trying to do every month to help our community educate them about healthy skin care and um, also want to take the opportunity to introduce a new physician. He is a professor from Ohio, Dr. Desmond Schiff, who uh, will be joining us uh, this year. He's uh, an expert in uh, hair, uh, in uh, a lot of other conditions uh, of the skin, nail also, and uh, will be working with me on some advanced cosmetic procedures this year. So today, since it's summer, we decided to talk about the sun. And as one of my uh, front desk uh, employees, Lila, decided to call it, skin cancer is hot. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, sun is hot, skin cancer is not. So, uh, very wise uh, saying. And what, what I want to really bring about is that in everything, I try to look at stuff as a yin and yang, the approach, because looking at stuff and saying simply that it's black and white, only good or bad, is wrong. But in order for us to understand the beneficial effects of the sun, which obviously without the star, without the sun in our solar system, we would not survive, we need to understand what really comes here, what's really the sun doing. So this is a diagram I took from the a comet program that uh, shows how much sun uh, rays come uh, to the Earth. So if we look at it, so this uh, yellow curve shows the amount of light that goes from the sun and reaches the Earth. About 43% is in the visible range, so this is the, what we actually see with our eyes. The rest of it is stuff that we don't see with our eyes. So we have 49% going in the infrared light. And the infrared light is actually very helpful for hair growth. It's also helpful for joint pains. And they found that in 1965, there was a researcher in Hungary who found low level light energy is actually very beneficial for a lot of reasons. And then you have the also non-visible, but on the other spectrum, the ultraviolet radiation, which out of the ultraviolet radiation, there is three types. There is UVC, UVB, and UVA. The ones that penetrate through the ozone layer are UVA and UVB. And those are really the rays that are responsible for some of the effects that we're going to concentrate on today. So those are really making only 7% of the sun's energy that reaches the Earth. And out of them, 5% is the UVB. So what does the UVB do? UVB helps us treat a lot of skin disorders. So if you go to the Dead Sea, the reason people get better in the Dead Sea is because it's the lowest place on Earth. And because it's the lowest place on Earth, there's a thicker amount of ozone layer that the sun rays have to pass. And the ones that reach the Earth on that specific point are at a specific wavelength that is extremely beneficial for a lot of rashes, whether it's vitiligo, whether it is um, uh, psoriasis. It's also very important for vitamin D production. And depending on the part of the Earth where you're located on, it also plays a role because of the angle that the Earth is tilted and how far it rotates around the sun, it will make a difference on the amount of the vitamin B uh, vitamin D that we're getting from the UVB ray. The other thing to remember is that UVB is the one that causes us the sunburn. So you got to be very careful with that. It causes, unfortunately, skin cancer. Uh, you get also the UVB from other things that we have here on Earth, even UVC. UVC is very dangerous. I used it when I did some research in the lab, but that's something that very quickly causes a lot of cancer. Um, so you can get that from welding devices. That's why you see them wearing the special goggles because you can get blind from that. And uh, also uh, you need to make sure it doesn't get to your eyes because the heat from it also can cause cancer. UVA on the other hand is what they use now in tanning beds. They used to use UVB in tanning beds. They realize it causes cancer, so they use UVA. But UVA is what causes a lot of the freckle, a lot of the aging that we have, and it's also linked with uh, melanoma. 
Now, a little bit statistics as to uh, the facts of what sun can cause. So, skin cancer accounts for one out of every three cancer worldwide. 33% of cancers are skin cancers. We're talking about both melanoma and non-melanoma. It is the most common cancer in the United States, skin cancer. Basal cells, about three to four million per year people develop basal cell skin cancer. Now, basal skin cancer, and I'll show you some pictures, and it's important, I tell all my patients, if you have a pimple and it doesn't go away in a month or two, you need to see a doctor. And if the doctor is not sure, always take a biopsy. And I have sometimes patients, they come to me and despite the many years of experience I have, they tell me, you know what, I don't like that stuff. And I look at it and it looks, looks like nothing. And maybe just a little bit eczema, but I trust them. I take a little bit test, just a small amount, and sometimes they're right, despite me thinking that it's probably going to be nothing. So some skin cancers are going to be so hard to detect that even someone who specializes in skin cancer all day does the surgeries will have difficult time detecting it. So you need to be in part with the patient. It's not doctor and patient, we're on the same footing. About 200,000 cases of melanoma will be diagnosed according to statistics this year. About 100,000 of them are going to be invasive melanoma. Before, that would be a death sentence. Now, thank God, due to immunotherapy, you know, 30 to 40 percent will survive from that. Uh, in terms of statistics and why it's important for our children to protect them from the sun, is one single blistering sunburn, and I've unfortunately had those as well, and I've had a skin cancer myself personally. One blistering sunburn doubles your risk factor to receive malignant melanoma. So it's very, very important. Now, just in terms of statistics, if we take out the basal and squamous cell out of the equation, for women, breast cancer comes first, then lung, then colorectal. For men, in terms of statistics from worldwide, uh, lung cancer, and all those things, look at them. We're causing ourselves those stuff. Why? You know, lung cancer, smoking, number one. You know, asbestos, we're not exposed to anymore. So a lot of those things, we know that we can avoid, and yet we don't avoid, just like we don't avoid sometimes the, the carcinogens with, with the sun. So you need to find the yin and yang. So I'm not saying stay out of the sun and not get the vitamin D, but I'm saying make sure that you do it right. And, and Dr. Sheep is going to later on talk about how to find that yin and yang, how to find the balance where you benefit from the sun, you get the healthy effects while trying to reduce the harmful effects of the sun. So we talk about diet, smoking, um, and very important to do self-exams as well. About half of the cases are found by the patient themselves when they come in. So I remember one time a patient came to me, showed me a very small spot, a two millimeter spot between her toes. And another doctor laughed and said, it's nothing. And she came to me and said, you know, I really don't like it. And I said, you know what, it looks okay, but if you don't like it, we can take a biopsy. It ends up being a melanoma. But if you look at the rules, the ABCs of melanoma, they say if it's bigger than a pencil eraser, then you have to worry about it. You know what, melanoma did not read the book. So it's not going to follow the rules. If you feel that something is weird, it's new, it's changing, take a little biopsy. You just need to make sure you do a nice job so you don't develop a huge scar and, and pain afterwards. So this is a gentleman who was a, a welder. Whether it was from welding or not, you can see different parts of skin cancer on his ear and his cheek. He was sent to me by another doctor. This was there God knows how long. But you can see here, sometimes it looks in a pearly way, it looks like there's no normal hair follicles. You can see very close up, this is his beard. Here it looks like you have those veins growing across. That's another thing that you see, it's pearly. Over the top of the ear, the same thing. Right over here, he's got another basal cell. So he's got a couple of basal cells there. And what we decided to do is we decided to actually not do the typical surgery because he's around 94 years old and I did something that I invented myself and you'll see him a year afterwards everything cleared without having to do surgery on him. So the important thing, if you have a question you can ask now, you don't have to wait. 
Yes. Anybody with a question? Yeah, I have yes. a question. When you say melanoma, <clears throat> is it a malignant? There could be a benign melanoma? So melanoma, melanoma, that's a very, very smart question. So uh, melanoma, no, 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 it's a very smart question. Melanoma is not a benign condition. There is a form called lentigo malignant melanoma. You hear the word malignant? Yeah, but, but, but so, so it's still considered a cancer because it grows. But if it stays in the uppermost layer of the skin, the horizontal layer of the skin, it is not going to kill you. But the question is, you know, imagine to yourself you, you have a, a dog that has a history of biting people. You know, do you want that dog being with you, even though it's a beautiful looking dog maybe? You know, do you want him living with you in the house and leaving your kids with him alone? I, I don't think so. So the same thing with that, you don't know at which point it will start growing vertically. And the moment, and you can't see it, and the moment it starts growing vertically, that's it, kaput, you know, you miss the boat. So you, uh, and the wider it is, the more you have to do surgery to remove it. So we don't play with those things, we'd rather remove them. This is not a melanoma though, this is the most common skin cancer there is, which is a basal, as we said, about 3 to 4 million patients a year develop it in the United States, the basal skin cancer. I had a basal skin cancer. When I had it, actually, it was in, in um, 2000. Yes, I was doing my fellowship in cosmetic surgery and my professors thought it was a little bit of a vessel. They wanted to do a laser. I said, no, no, thank you. And the other the one thought it was just a little pimple, wanted to spray it. I said, no, no, thank you. I looked at it, didn't go away for six months and I took a biopsy. I was right and I removed it and I don't have anymore. But I remember my, my mom and my wife said, I'm crazy. You know, what are you talking about? It can't be. You, you don't think that as a young person you can have it. I was. I was at that time 29, I think, years old, was right before the birth of my first son. So anyway, um, what can we do? So let's, let's look at this diagram. This diagram I designed in order to explain how a healthy cell can develop into a skin cancer cell. So here on the right side of the screen, you see a healthy cell, and on the top, you see some of the things that make the healthy cell mutate and change slowly to a pre-malignant and eventually to a skin cancer. Those are the red ones that shows how it initiates and how it progresses into a skin cancer. And on the bottom you see all the approved and with the asterisks and non-approved methods that we can use to push the skin cancer uh, away into healthy cells. One of the things that is important to see is certain foods increase even skin cancer. Not talking about gastrointestinal cancer and that's why I want to show you guys because colorectal cancer is one of the top three cancers both in men and women. So food that are charred, you know, we like sometimes that, you yeah. know, barbecue, it's the 4th of July and stuff like that, we, we make it, but the black, and I was just like, why my wife cuts off that black? I, I, I love it, it smells good, it looks good and who wants to throw away food? You know what? It's better to throw it than to increase the risk of cancer in our system. So the, the charred food increase risk of skin cancer and other type of cancers. It's a carcinogen. Uh, other thing in topping that list is ultraviolet radiation. And again, Dr. Ship is going to talk to us how to find the perfect balance to avoid the harmful UV lights. So if we look at skin cancer, the most effective way to guarantee uh, that you have the complete skin cancer removal is the Mohs surgery method and Mohs surgery is named so after the person who invented it he was a medical student when he presented this people laughed at him it was in the 1920s 30s and the only people who actually listened to him were dermatologists he was a surgeon the surgeons laughed at him and that's how it became a field of dermatology the Mohs surgery and what it allows you to do is to examine all the edges and make sure you got it completely removed. But there's nothing in medicine that's 100%, and that's why it's 99%. But if you look further down the line, uh, Clinton, for example, he had scraping and burning of the one that he had on his back. I remember when I was doing my fellowship at UPenn, we were laughing that he didn't get the best treatment option. But you know what? As a president, he didn't want to spend and show that he spends the most amount of money on himself because most is a little more expensive than just scraping it. Uh, you can do radiation. The problem is you don't see whether you got it all out. Um, the other thing that I sometimes use is I use a cream 
uh, and you can use a cream in certain people, it will help about 80% of the time. And you can also use a pill that was approved in 2012, uh, the pill to take, and you can take that pill and I'll tell you about the trick that I invented of how to use it safely and increase the cure rate. And that's what I actually did for that big cancer that the person had and some other people. And then you can do lasers and some other non-FDA approved treatments. So, let's see what that so guy is. So this ar arsenic is, means? There was a word. Arsenic. Arsenic? Yes, yeah. arsenic is a carcinogen. Arsenic has been uh, found uh, sometimes in wells. So when you dig the wells and you were uh, in Russia, for example, there was no water maybe in the pipes or somewhere in the rural areas. They build wells from the groundwater. And sometimes the groundwater contains arsenic. Arsenic. And that arsenic increases the risk for uh, skin cancer. You can actually see there is a, a known sign when you look at the hands, there are little pits, and that's how you know there is arsenic exposure. So there's some clues to that. Thank you for the question. So this is uh, a good response. If you remember the person before, this was him before, and this is him after during the middle of the treatment. So all this means that it's responding, it's doing very well, you see it's getting crusty and red. So we did the combination of the pills and the cream and you can see him afterwards. So everything healed without surgery. He has a scar where the skin healed by itself, the ear completely looks good and there was nothing left and that was proven by follow-up biopsies. And he's, you know, since unfortunately died and it's good that during the three years that he had left to live, I did not torture him by doing huge surgery that would have possibly involved nerves and stuff like that. So the key is obviously find it early. But if you don't, there are other options. So people don't have to worry about going to the doctor because they go to the doctor, they're going to have a huge scar and surgery. There are other options if they don't mind trying them. All right. So here we come to the really fun stuff and I'll uh, have Dr. Sheep uh, tell you more about it to answer some of the questions about how to protect against the ultraviolet light, uh, what sunblock to use, uh, what makes one sunblock better than another sunblock. Uh, there was a question that Sergey told me what is safe for the reefs, so for the environment, um, what SPF number to use, is 100 better, is 50 better, and Dr. Ship will talk to you about it right now. So. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming out today. Once again, my name is Desmond Ship, and it's a pleasure for everyone in cyberspace. Um, of course, I'm glad that you guys were able to watch us here. So we can give you some pointers and some things that help you um, understand about the sun and how to protect yourself. So, so how do you protect against UV? So does anyone have that answer to that? Anyone know how we're protecting against UV, ultraviolet radiation and so forth? Stay out of the sun. Stay out of the sun is one way. So no sun, you're Use protecting cream. yourself. Use cream. And that's exactly what we recommend. Umbrella. Umbrellas are great. Umbrellas are great. Sunblock, umbrellas, you also are telling me different things that you can use. So as dermatologists, we always counsel our patients to protect yourself from the sun. As what Dr. Levisit said earlier, it can cause you to develop skin cancers. And we want to prevent that. We love seeing you, but we don't want to see you because of your skin cancer. We'd rather see you just to say you're looking good, nothing to worry about. So essentially with sunblocks and so forth. I'm going to skip to the next slide and I'll come back and I'll answer these questions throughout the presentation. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. If I'm speaking too fast, please let me know. I sometimes speak a little too fast. If I need to speak louder, let me know as well. Okay? We're from New York. We're used to fast speakers. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So once again, that's myself, Desmond Ship, um, a first year fellow, a fellow here with Dr. Levitt. And it's a pleasure to meet everyone. So for those of you, I don't like sunscreens. We generally use sunscreens to protect ourselves from the sun. Okay, there's different types of sunscreens. There's physical blockers, and those act as shields. Those protect us from letting the sun penetrate our skin. And then we have chemical blockers. Those are essentially like sponges. They absorb the UV radiation. They break it down until it doesn't cause negative um, sun cancers to develop in our skin. Now I'll get to a little bit more information about that because one is better than the other. And as we talk today, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So for those who don't like sunscreens, there's clothing that you can wear. So there's new clothing that you can wear that has sunscreen embedded into the fibers. So for us, yes, indeed. <laughs> You're looking like, whoa, yes, indeed. So I'm going to go over that. So a few places that you can get this are at L.L. Bean, 
Athleta, Lily Pulitzer, Lance Inn, and Cooley Bar. Now, I don't own any stock in any of these companies. You can research it yourself and find which one you like the best. But essentially what they do is they have the sunscreen embedded into the fibers, and those help to protect you for going into the sun. Now, for all of a, those of us who don't like to apply the sunscreen to our skin, every two hours, which was what we recommend, you apply 15 minutes before you go outdoors, every two hours thereafter. If you're not able to do that, then wearing protective clothing is and just as good or even better. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I generally tell people to apply like healthy clothing like this. Um, you can actually wear hats, you can wear long sleeve shirts and so forth. <coughs> We're going to go to the next slide. So now. Qu question. Yes, question. Should, <coughs> if one uh, would say, okay, I'm going to be under the umbrella all the time mm -hmm. versus I'll be wearing sunscreen all the time. Mm -hmm. what, what does the statistics show which one is more effective uh, staying in the shade under the umbrella mm -hmm. or using a sunblock so that's a, that's a great question i'm going to answer to it twofold so it depends how much of your body is under the sun i mean actually under the umbrella generally people still have the sun exposed to their skin when they're under an umbrella now if you're completely in the shade i will go for that because you're actually preventing yourself from getting a lot of that sun now, if you are going to wear sunscreen, I recommend that you're using a physical blocker and you need to have an SPF of 30 or greater. Why 30? Well, what they found is that when you use a 30 or greater, it prevents you from getting 97% of the UV radiation that comes through. Now, if you say, can I use a 50? Can I use a 100? I mean, those are really, really great products to use. But after a while, you're not going to get any benefit from using those. Nothing in sunscreen is 100%. But we try to get to as close as 100 as possible. So at least start with an SPF of 30 or greater. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one thing that I would only add is when you're looking at the SPF number, mm -hmm. it's only corresponds to the UVB UV. protection. Exactly. It doesn't protect you against the UVA. Exactly. But when you're adding the components that Dr. Sheep is talking about, the zinc and titanium, which are the physical uh, blockers, which are also safer for the environment, etc. You'll talk about the nano size of them as well. But those uh, uh, will be also um, <coughs> will also be, what were we talking about? Protection uh, against the um, sun. Which one is better? If you're in the um, umbrella all day? Right, right, right. right, right. Yeah, 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 but, but there was something else about it. So, so if, if you're using the, the, the physical black, they also give you some UVA protection as well. That's what I want to say. But not exactly. full UVA protection, the physical, the zinc and the titanium. But obviously, like Dr. Sheep said, if you were ha having that shirt, which I also like to wear, they're really breathable. You think you sweat and you can't breathe in them? but they're breathable. And you can take it off, you know, a little bit and put it back on so you're not with it all the time. Agreed, but I agree with you. So Thank here's you. our best friend. Yes, sir. Uh, what happening after laundry? Maybe it's still a question. No, no, that's In terms of the sunscreen yeah. quality is characteristic, yeah. it's yeah. still uh, present in that both? That is a great question. I'm going to answer that in a few slides. Okay. I'm going to go through that and I'm going to show you how you can actually uh, make your own clothing sun protective against UV irrigation instead of spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars with some of these websites. There's another way that you can do that. So I'm going to get that to maybe my last slide. So can you bear with me for a few? Perfect, perfect. So this is our favorite friend. Um, this is a sun ray. It looks great. I want to break it down a little bit more of what Dr. Um, Levet had mentioned in the beginning. So he talked about UVB, UVA, and UVC. Fortunately for us, UVC doesn't penetrate our ozone layer. So we're okay from that standpoint. Now there's UVB and there's UVA. And there's this thing that we measure it. And we measure it in nanometers, okay? So UVA is broken into two different sections. There's UVA1 and UVA2. Now UVA1 spans from 340 nanometers to 400, okay? And then we have UVA2, which spans from 320 nanometers to 340. So we have a little sweet spot from that standpoint. Then we have UVB. Now UVB can be helpful, as Dr. Levitt had mentioned earlier. We were talking about that as well. Um, but the UVB is a little bit different. So that one goes from 290 to 320. <coughs> now it's important for us because when we learn about these, we need to tell why we need the sunscreen and which things are going to protect us from the UVB and UVA. Okay? Now, why should we wear the sunscreen? Does anyone know why we should wear the sunscreen? I'm re-asking re the same question I was asked earlier, but I just want to make sure that you all, it sticks in the brain today. Why are we wearing sunscreen? Protection. 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 Protect, uh, our skin from cancer. 
Exactly. You're not protecting just you. You're protecting your family because we want those genes to be passed on, correct? If you pass away, unfortunately, from a skin cancer in your family and things like that, you may lose some, some longevity. So we make sure we keep you as healthy as possible. Now, Dr. Levitt said he was about 29 when he developed it. When I was practicing, we saw kids as young as six years old developing. And they had some genetic disorders as well. But you can get sunscreen, I mean, um, skin cancers at a very, very young age. So it's important that kiddos are applying it as well. Fair enough? So how can we? So essentially, one in five Americans will develop a cancer in their lives. Um, and that's been published on the American Academy of Dermatology. The number that they quote is that they say one person will die from melanoma every hour. So I say about approximately 20 to 24 in a um, day's period. So it's very, very important that you're getting your skin examinations. If you notice anything abnormal, you contact your dermatologist and you get seen. I don't care if you were seen two weeks prior, if it wasn't noted at that visit, you come back in and be seen again. Does that make sense? All right. So we have to do that. And then lastly, protecting our skin, um, the best way that you can do that is using a broad, um, a broad spectrum um, sunscreen, if you're going to use a sunscreen, broad spectrum. Now if you go to our AAD website, we actually have some lists on here, some very important um, things that you can do. So broad spectrum. So the broad spectrum, this means the sunscreen protects you from UVA and UVB. Um, both of which can cause skin cancers. Now, one is more common than the other that's causing uh, the skin cancers, but it's just important that you're using both of those. Like I said earlier, SPF of 30 or greater um, is very, very important. Um, if you go higher than that, that's great. But like I said, 97% of the rays are protected at that um, SPF of 30. You want something that is water resistant or very water resistant, and that's about 80 minutes. So if you hop in the water, and that sunscreen falls off, you need to reapply it. And we always take to do it 15 minutes before you go outdoors. <clears throat> it's important to remember, 15 minutes before you get into the water. Indeed. Because people sometimes wait, they go to the beach and then they apply it, they have the sand on their hands, they have the sand on their face. So my, my family always laughs because they start going walking to the beach and I'm staying behind in the bathroom applying my sunblock. But then I know I did it and I can go out and enjoy it. As opposed to over there, everybody already wants to run out, you know, you kind of get the dog out of the house, he's already out of the house. Mm -hmm. While he's in the house, he can take care of him and make sure he's doing what he needs to. And this is just a picture re, um, showing about the, the protection where you have the physical blockers versus the chemical blockers. Like I said earlier, one acts as a sponge, which is a chemical, and the physical blocker acts more of like a uh, shield. So that's important for you to know. Now, when you guys were looking in the um, grocery stores, yes ma'am? Yes, I have a question yes, that just popped through my mind. Yes. Applying sunscreen, yes. at what specific part of the body are we going to apply? Your entire body. Your entire Wait, body. So my entire body, even Anything. the stuff that's covered now, by things the clothes? Now, now, I'll answer this twofold. So if you're like in a bathing suit or something, yeah. you have a cover-up, sometimes those cover-ups still aren't thick enough and they allow that sunlight to penetrate through. So I still recommend that you're still putting that on. Now, if you have a regular, a regular thick shirt, retired. I don't have a problem with you applying it. Don't apply it to those areas that are covered. Oh. Now, things that are uncovered, like your face, face your uh -huh. ears, very, very important, even your neck. I think oftentimes people forget about this area in the back of their necks, um, so that's very important. So, to answer your question, apply it to the areas that are actually being seen by the sun. If the clothing is in the proper position, you have the right clothing. If not, then apply it to the entire body. A question that hasn't been asked is about the sprays. Now, me personally, I don't recommend the sprays. Um, I did research and we learned about nanoparticles and so forth and it have been shown that you can inhale those things and they've been shown to cause maybe lung cancers in those areas. So remember those things we can prevent from causing that. So I tell people if you are going to use the sprays, do not spray it directly at this area. Spray it on your hand and gently massage it onto your skin. Does anyone use sprays in this office? And how are you applying it? Yes, but not in Good, 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 good. That's good. So continue to do that. So uh, we would we'll say, we'll say two, two things. Mm -hmm. When you're putting a shirt on, it's important that you use the shirt that mm -hmm. Dr. Sheep is talking about. Because if you look at the SPF of a white t-shirt, mm -hmm. it has SPF of six mm -hmm. only. So the way to look on how effective the clothing you're wearing, one option is put it against the light. If you see the light coming through it, your body sees it too. If you are behind a glass in the car, for example, 
UVB is blocked. UVB cannot pass through the glass. UVA does pass. So in terms of aging, if you want to reduce aging, yes, you would cover. Anyway, UVB that causes you to improve your vitamin D is not going to be passing through the windshield glass. So might as well look younger. Now, women who put makeup on, there is some SPF in that makeup, but it's not a physical blocker and therefore it gets deactivated in two to four hours. A physical blocker is like a t-shirt. You do not remove it, it stays on, it does its effect. A chemical blocker like oxybenzone, benzophenone, some of those chemicals will cause an oxidative reaction with the sun uh, light and will get used up within two to four hours the moment it gets exposed to the air even if you're not in direct sunlight okay so the makeup that you put on the tint has a physical block but the chemical inside that sunblock will be lost losing its effect okay windows in my apartment they get I get the sunlight all the time right that's UVA not UVB okay and also it, very harmful uh, it's uh, you're, you're not getting that much, so I wouldn't be so concerned about that specifically. It's, that you're not because of the glass that I'm getting? Because you're not getting the UVB that causes a burn. Yes, you're getting some UVA, but usually you're not walking in front of the window naked. Most people. <laughs> so, 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 so you'll be fine. But, uh, and, and there is also a distance. It's not like you're standing against the glass like that, you know? It stands a few minutes, not all Yes. Alright, so. Um, lastly, just when you're going to your grocery store and you're buying sunscreens and so forth, um, there's been some new things published and I want to make sure that everyone's up to date with that. Um, essentially, chemical blockers, I'm staying away from those. I generally tell people to use the physical blockers. And when you see a physical blocker, it's going to say these two products, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. These are the two things that you expect to see in your product. Now, if you see any of these products on your right-hand side, which is the left side of the screen, Anything that has a zone or eight in it, A-T-E or Z-O-N-E, try to stay away from those. Those able benzones. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So able benzene, uh, I'm sorry, able benzone, and then you also have oxybenzones and so forth. Those have been shown to cause allergic reactions as well. Um, and some new literature that's been published about cancers and things of that nature. So I kind of stay away from those products, okay? So if you see anything that has Z-O-N-E, at the end of it, or ATE at the end of it, most likely you want to stay away from those. Fair enough? And these ones are good, right? The left is what we want you to have. The right, these products have been in the literature a little bit more frequently about causing some um, problems, so I kind of stay away from those. Here is more chemical, here is more, more You're 100%, yeah. I hate to stress it, but I'm a physical blocker, <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you can, do that as much as you can with your protective clothing. Now, remember I spoke to you earlier, I'm going to address your question now about washing your clothes and so forth. Dr. Levitt had mentioned earlier that a white shirt only has an SPF of about 5 to 6 around there. Um, so what you can do, and I know this is kind of counterintuitive what I said earlier, you can actually make your clothing um, sun protective by applying this um, chemical. So you can actually use those chemical blockers, which is really weird, I'm telling you to do that now. You can actually spray them, but just make sure you're looking the other direction or wearing a mask. You can spray them, you can actually take an iron and it actually causes that to get embedded into your clothing fibers, okay? That should be good for about four cycles if you were to wash them. Does that make sense? Now the coolie bar that you're going to purchase, if you do, are the other LL brands, then this last have a longer longevity than the ones that you do at your home. But like I said on here, there's a website, um, www.adsco, if you have your phones and you can take a photo of this, they actually have a way that you can actually make your clothing UV blocker safe um, and it will treat about four white dress shirts with a 17 ounce bottle. Ooh, so that's an air. Oh, I'm not going to change it. I won't change it. Sorry. So that's a website that you all can check out. Um, they also really, really get some information on there as well. Um, and that's how I UV block my clothing as well. Fair enough. Does anyone have any questions before Dr. Levitt comes back up? I have a question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you like experiment? I cover like one half of my face with a chemical blocker and the other half with a physical one. But the problem was when I came home, it was like really hard to remove the physical one. So yes. I had to wash like triple of times with different cleansers. Yes, yes, yes. Would you recommend to, uh, how would you recommend to remove physical <coughs> blockers? And do you recommend to uh, put moisturizers after or how we should do? 
Also with the physical blockers, you know, just use a gentle slope. You're going to have to have to, that's the big thing about it. They're acting, acting, acting as a shield, so it's going to be a little bit more challenging to get off of your skin. Um, I can tell you thousands of ways to wash, but just gentle until it rubs off. Okay. If you're going back outside, still keep that same layer on and just reapply it. If you remember Rodney Dangerfield in the movie where he was a swimmer and he had the big white paste on it, I mean, a lot of people have gone, um, they're not using that anymore, but that's what we want. That's that white paste that really protects your skin, you know, that's the titanium and the zincs and things like that. So I'm all for that. And also the other question, what if you have like a sunburn, mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't protect yourself? Yes. What would be like the, the best aid, what would be the best way to... Uh, yeah. There's, different degrees, to There's different degrees of sunburns. There's different degrees of sunburns. If you have a really, really severe one, we also recommend that you take some type of inset to help to calm down some of the inflammation and irritation. Another thing that you can use is you can apply a little topical steroid over that area, which also acts to calm down some of that irritation as well. If you have significant burning, I always tell people you can apply ice to that area. But the number one thing you want to do is prevent that from occurring. And generally when that happens, the person hasn't applied enough sunscreen or the right sunscreen or in the right duration of time. So if you can follow those rules, one, apply the sunscreen 15 minutes before you go outdoors. Two, make sure you apply it every two hours thereafter. Three, I always recommend that you use a physical blocker. That's the way I take care of my skin. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Who has more uh, risk, uh, guy who has blonde hair and blue eyes, mm -hmm. or guy who has dark hair and dark blue? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every time when we go to beach, he always red. So, you know, <laughs> that's a loaded question because genes play a factor in that as well. So if you have family history of it, um, then you're going to have to be a little bit more susceptible to developing skin cancers. But as far as blonde, eye, I mean blonde hair and blue eyes, you're a little bit more susceptible to sun damage. And if you're more susceptible to sun damage, you're a little bit higher risk for developing skin cancers. So if you can apply that sunscreen. Um, even myself, I'm susceptible for skin cancers as well. Now, when I get a skin cancer before a person who has blue eyes and blonde hair, less likely. But there's always that risk if I'm out there for long periods of time. Another question. Sometimes uh, after the sun, I get a rash. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what is that? <laughs> well, anytime you get a rash, yeah. Whenever you say a rash, it's like a cat in a bag. There's so many different things that you can come up with the rash. Is it because of the sun itself? Is it because of medication that you apply? Is it because you're allergic to something? Is it because of food you ate? Sometimes if you eat limes in the sun, you can get a rash if it hits your leg for certain ways. So, there's a lot of things that can be added to that. So I can't answer your question directly, um, but if you're trying to say, like, if I get in the sun, I get a rash, just keep yourself protected, use that sunscreen. Mm -hmm. yes. Sorry. It's also, I think, very important to mention that when you look at the SPF and you're wondering, well, I used the SPF 30, like I was advised, how come it didn't work? There is a wonderful study that was done in France about how much of the sunblock to apply. And that's why I like sometimes the tinted sunblocks because they will show you that you apply it and the areas you didn't apply will not be tinted. So you need to make sure that you use a really sufficient amount because that's how they measure the SPF in the lab. So when it says an SPF of 50 and you're like, well, I applied an SPF of 60, how come I got a sunburn in that same area? That's because you probably, even if I reapply it, it's because you didn't put a thick enough layer. So the spray, definitely not a good idea. I mean, we know about the mustard gas used in World War I. Germans used it against the British. It backfired and, and the air changed and it went against them. So that was an excellent idea. And here's what another Dr. thing said. to reiterate what Dr. Levin just said. So you need about one ounce of sunscreen to cover the entire body. So if you're only using a small amount, that's not going to be enough. So you need about one ounce. And that's on our website, American Academy of Dermatology. So if you'd like, you can actually take a photo of this because this has the main points of sunscreen, how to apply it, and so forth. How oh, about well, lips? Indeed. So chap sticks that have chap sticks or lip glosses and so forth that have an SPF in them are great. Um, I use one as well. Um, the company, I don't know any stocks in this company either um, that I use, and my wife is the one who really loves this. It's called. This one is called organic. Um, 
Yeah. Lip balm, smooth, effective. Uh, I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. And I'll get back to Dr. Levin's part. Uh, there was there was one question uh, they want to ask about uh, your your uh, viewers mm -hmm. Sergey's viewers want to ask yeah. about what is safe for nature so everybody is looking at what is safe for nature right go back to what Dr. Sheep said so if you are going to use the physical blocker they've shown they're much safer for the corals and for the marine life the other thing is the size of the particles. So everybody doesn't want that uh, danger-filled uh, pasty look, so they use the nanoparticles. So you want to look at the size of the nanoparticles. If it's more than 30 nanometers, nanoparticles, whatever <laughs> size it is, then it's safe because it's thicker. It's not going to be absorbed inside, will not cause in your bloodstream, like Dr. Sheep said, increase of uh, cancer. But uh, when you go swim, it will also not be absorbed on the coral reef because it's not going to be absorbed in the water and it will become part of the sediment of the bottom of the ocean so that uh, marine life is not going to also absorb it in their, in their skin. So uh, just, uh, you know me, I, I love stories. So here is uh, story time. So uh, gentleman on the left, he uh, was uh, told that he's got some psoriasis. He went to get some light treatment, get light and he actually got worse in the light. So, what does he have? Well, he has over here red bumps that are over the knuckles. And he has them around the nails. And that's called dermatomyositis. So, this is a condition that gets worse, you know, one of the photosensitivity disorders. So, you, this is one thing. On the other side, there was a gentleman who had this thick red things that he was told he's got, he's got fungus. He did not have fungus. He had psoriasis. So that one, the light actually helps. Now, what do you guys think about the, the picture in the middle? Cancer. What does he have? Cancer. Mm. Cancer. What kind of cancer do you think he has? Skin cancer. <laughs> Where? Here, under, there? Uh, under, under the nail. Under the nail. That's actually very true. Wow. So the, the person over there uh, came to me and she actually came with her husband and I told her to undress to take off her shoes. She's like, why, why am I taking off my shoes? I just want you to look at my face and, and that's, that's about it. Because I said, well, when we do a complete skin exam, as Dr. Sheep was mentioning, we specialize in hair, skin and nails. You got to look at the nails too. And so she took off her socks and the shoes. She didn't have, thank God, nail polish and we saw this on her nail. And I said, we need to take a biopsy. We took a biopsy, it didn't show really much. I said, I don't like it still. I brought it to Colombia for a big conference and uh, the uh, person who was my teacher, uh, was also the president of the American Academy of Dermatology, uh, uh, Dick Sher, Richard Sher, he said he agrees and the entire thing should be removed. It was a big, um, I think I took a, a six millimeter or four millimeter punch and he said, take even bigger. And uh, so we took even a, a bigger excision and showed it was indeed a melanoma. So the whole nail and even Not deeper. the whole nail, but the entire area had to be tested. And uh, this was indeed a melanoma. And she would come back afterwards uh, thanking me for examining that. So it's important. It looks a little bit different than it will look on the skin. And uh, you know, just, just make sure that you check everything. That's why without nail polish, when you go to get a skin check, you should do that. Uh, she was she was 72, 73 years old. But you know what? Uh, talking about the yin and yang of, of sun, I remember uh, I was in Aruba. There was this uh, very. I was about to take a flight, and right next to all the shops, there was a guy sitting with sandals, with a beautiful green eyes, talking about this blonde hair, green eyes, sunburned, and with shorts and sandals. And I remember passing them, thinking to myself, you know what? And he's obviously flying away. I think. Who is staying in Aruba, this is November, and going into another place that is warm? I mean, I would stay where it's warm. Why would you want to necessarily go to Aruba? And as I was passing by, I, my eyes went down and saw something on his nail. And I like, did I see something? Could it be possibly a, a melanoma? So I went there and he was sitting here. So I went one way and then I'm like, yeah, let me look. So I, so I did a double take, you know, I went the other way <laughs> back around. 
and uh, and I was like, okay, let me look at the signs. Is his proximal nail fold involved? Is it only on one nail, or does he have other nails? And I tried to do it so he cannot notice me doing it. And then I was like, okay, so it's only one nail. Um, it's uh, involving a little bit the proximal nail fold. And now my job is, do I come to him and he thinks that this guy is a freak, what the hell does he want with me? Or do I just go home and forget about it? And I said, you know what, I won't be able to sleep. Because Dr. Ship and I, we, we think alike, you know, as a physician, you have a responsibility. Let him say I'm crazy, but I'll sleep better. I did my job. So I come up to him and how do you do it nicely without him thinking yeah, that you're a pervert? Just tell him. That you're a pervert. <laughs> just tell him. Well, I mean, what do you tell him? You have a cancer? <laughs> So, 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 I, so I came up to him, you know, I'm sorry to bother you, but, but uh, I apologize. Did you have this thing on your nail for a while? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's getting better. I, I, I've seen already, you know, people and, and it's getting better. So I was like, okay, I did my job. And then like, no, I really didn't do my job. So, so I go back to him and he's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, this guy's not leaving me alone. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm, like I'm sorry. Um, did they give you a pill and it started getting lighter? You've had it for about two years. And he's looking at me like that. I was like, how did you know? I was like, okay, did, did you see, did you see a, a skin doctor? And he's like, no, no, I saw two podiatrists and, and one uh, internal medicine doctor, primary care physician, and they gave me Lamisil, which is a pill to give for fungus, and it got lighter. Um, I said, okay. I said, well, uh, he said, why? Do you think they, they, did they take a biopsy? I said, they take a little test of the nails, like, no, why should they? So we got into a discussion and I, I gave him my uh, uh, information and he was apparently from Canada and I know how long you have to wait to get an appointment in Canada. So I said, look, you have time. If, within six months, let's make sure someone sees you. If they question why they need to do a biopsy, here's my uh, number, you can, my office number and my email. They can call me, send me an email. So this was Saturday. So I fly back and Monday I was doing surgery, skin cancer, most surgery, and my manager Zoe comes up to me, did you see a patient in Aruba? And I'm like, I was on vacation, what are you talking about? I didn't see any patient, I'm in surgery, leave me alone. I'm like, well, this guy says you, he saw you. He said he saw you and he said that he has something on his nail, he wants to fly in. And I'm like, no, what if I'm wrong? He's down in Canada, he's gonna spend money, he's gonna fly in now to, to, to New York. And I'm like, uh... Yes, I did see him, but let him see our people over there. <laughs> let him not come here. Anyway, he ends up flying Friday. He's flying in, and I'm seeing him, and I'm thinking, you know, what a schmuck I am. Now, if I'm wrong, he spent all the money. I take a biopsy from the nail, ends up, and he flies back. And he ends up being melanoma. And he's very grateful because he was a single dad. His wife died from cancer. And... Um, Six months after we were done with the melanoma, everything was done and healed. He didn't have to have an amputation of the toe, it was fine, we just removed the, the skin cancer. It was done in, at Columbia, a Presbyterian hostel, uh, by a wonderful doctor, um, Dr. Brent Tabak. He gets a call that he has an appointment with a dermatologist in the month. He said, are you guys crazy? You already took care of everything. So anyway, thank God for the United States of America and for our health system. So, uh, there are different types of sunscreens and sunblocks, like Dr. Sheep explained. So some of them, let me see which one this is. This uh, has zinc oxide. So, so this one has a little bit whitish, creamy paste, and you can pass it around. When, when, you, when you put it on, if you rub it in, it's micronized. So the nano, it's nanoparticles, but it's bigger than 30 nanoparticles. So, so the size, so you don't see it, but when I shower, I still see the white, and my wife tells me, look, you still smell, yeah, it does, uh, some of them smell a little bit with the sunblock, and you still have it, but it's physical, so my family doesn't have an allergic reaction, my daughter has a little allergy to some of the chemicals, but to this she does not, but it is a little white and pasty, I'm going to show you another cream, you can pass that around, and this one is the 41, now on, on my skin, when I apply this 41, again, that's also a, a physical blocker. It's the only active ingredient is zinc over here. When I apply this one on, as you can see, it has a little tint. Um, so you, even, even um, my wife was very, uh, you know, on top of the latest cosmetic and how to make things look nice, likes this one. Because when you put it on, it has a little tint. Uh -huh. But as you rub it in, you don't see it. 
in no oily film either. She will want to feel it. No. Right. No. So, so it's not oily. So you can you can pass that along. So they really are very good now with the sandblocks that they're having and the chemicals and the non-chemical sandbox. And we just, both of us, uh, I'm happy that Dr. Shipp agrees, but prefer One the physical. One question that came up, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's a lot of questions that you asked me. I, see you, I look at the weather for tomorrow. By the way, by the way, by the way, one second. One thing everybody also forgets, you asked about where to put the sandbox. Nails. Don't forget, don't get no no one. When I go out, I remind myself I put it Maybe because I was one of the people who came up with the rules for nail no no I actually wrote the article. So you also put it on your hands and your nails. I put on the nails too. Yes. Yes. Now that, that's an example of what I was saying that UVA is most likely the cause of melanoma more than UVB because the nail is like the glass. So through it, UVB really doesn't pass, but the UVA does. And think about the amount of time that we spend. What they're saying more is that it's episodic exposure to sun. So it's not the chronic exposure to sun that brings the melanoma on a regular basis. But it's the episodic exposures on and off. Our body does not have enough time to protect itself properly or knowledge ability to protect itself yeah. from the harmful rays of the sun okay. and so that episodic with the nails and the feet which is more common than the hands even gets no normal. Yeah. Um, okay. Looking for a forecast for tomorrow, for example, okay. now you see that you getting out of the house the following day, it's cloudy, no sun out. Is there a reason still to apply? Sure. Yes. I mean, well, this is the question that comes up um, yeah. in my mind all the time. Excellent question. Even if you don't see it, it's still present. It's so under the cloud of clouds. You're 100% correct. So you still want to keep yourself protected. It's always better to be safe than sorry. So because in the forecast, it says cloudy, 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 yet UV factor, right. 9. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So that should not deter me from not using creams or anything. Correct. And, and that's another reason why when you're saying, if I'm in the shade, do I need to use a sunblock? Yes. People forget that there is a reflection from inanimate object, whether it's from the sun, from the, from the snow when you're high up and it's you know winter and it's cloudy, whether it's from the ocean, from the water or from the sand, people say, oh, but it was cloudy, how did I get a sunburn? Yeah. Everything together makes, makes you um, get the sunburn. Thank you, everyone. One, one thing that, that I will mention, that uh, one of the melanomas that we diagnosed very late, and it has happened to me too, um, and that's the melanoma that is amelanotic. About 10% of melanomas have no color. And I remember one of my first patients that in 2000 when I was doing my fellowship at UPenn and I was trying to earn a little more money and I was working at my mom's practice here in Brooklyn and I saw this young lady, she had a little tiniest, tiniest pimple on her, on her face and I said, you know, it could be a basal cell skin cancer. Let me take the biopsy, I took a shape biopsy, came back, no, no, I'm like, no way, there's no way. And then she went to Sloan Catering and like, we can't see the spot, where did you do the biopsy? <clears throat> they looked at the slides, everything, they ended up doing the surgery. It was so early that we got all of it out. The point is they can even look like that. And usually the ones that are detected late and people die from is usually that one, the amelonotic melanoma. And it looks like weird. It look, had no color, how can it have? So anything that you have that is new or that is changing, that is not going away in a month or two, go, go, see, go see a board certified dermatologist. Five, 10, 15 years. Does that mean anything? It depends when you got it. If you got it, if you got it after 40, 50, I'll be more uh, worried because you can get new moles into your 40s. Okay, and maybe you when you were 20, 20 years ago. You know what? It's it's difficult to tell. Yeah. Because when you look at it every day, you may not notice it growing. Yeah. But it may have grown. So, for example, the guy that I showed you with the cheek, I mean. He thought it was not changing, but you can see, if you saw it in the city, you're like, whoa, what happened to you? This is definitely, you were not born with it. No, no, I had it for a long time. 
it's hard when you're looking at yourself. It's, it's difficult. So better to have not only yourself, but also um, your spouse looking at you. So many of the moments that I find, I don't know what, what you see, but the women usually find it on their husband's back. I've had that happen often. Uh, men, we're not so good at looking for this kind of stuff on our ladies. We should be better. But the women more commonly have it on the back of their calves, the melanoma. So that's an area to check, although you should check everything. Classically, I want to ask, how much you trust clothes? Because we use a lot of clothes. Special clothes, whatever you show. protection. We buy this all the time. Yeah. And special because we just spent two months in the Florida, on the ocean. Excellent. So we use a little bit of cream. Unfortunately, I do yeah, like a spray. I never knew that the real cream, the cancer. cream. And, and the Now I'm going ruining. to use the cream. I will never use any more spray. <laughs> and then to put clothes and a lot of people who I know who are in our building, uh, we're going in the ocean, everybody wearing the clothes, special hat, and so I'm inside. But still put the sound on. And, yeah. yes, and the, the hat was supposed to be this, not with okay. open ears, something special. With the big it's, easy, better it's, with it's better wide brim. I mean, look look at people they, in, they the, sell, in the, they sell this. In the Sahara or in Africa, they have that thing that goes right, right, back right, over right, there. Right, right, but, right. but, you know, if I would wear it, I would be thrown out of the house. So I just make sure I have plenty of sunblock. Um, who the is saying you shouldn't be out in the sun from 10 to 3 generally? What, does that mean a certain parts of the year, like winter, summer, fall? Does that matter depending on season? Um, season does play a factor. You know, like, we like still hold the thing. We still hold the same thing true. Ten to four is when you have the most UV radiation penetrating the earth. But it's more in the summer than in the winter. More in the summer, depending on what side of the globe you're on. Mm -hmm. But we still recommend it just to keep everyone in the same playing field from ten to four. That's when you're at your highest risk for getting those UV radiations. So you put this on even in the winter time? Yes, ma'am. I do. I do. I personally don't tend to go for I, I, I don't do that, but I'm not a very good patient. Uh, but I'll also tell you i also tell you that it's also important to get the vitamin D. Yeah. So face I would protect more. Maybe the arms I would allow a little bit more uh, sun to, to, to go through. Uh, so you can get, because without it, you will not get it, but you can also take the supplement of the vitamin D. And I'll also tell you, the darker the skin color you have, the more likely you will be vitamin D deficient. Yeah. And in the winter time, they did studies, people would stand naked at Harvard, where they were studying the vitamin D deficiency, uh, would stand naked like that, and their vitamin D level will be zero. So the light that penetrates, it's really not effective or not enough in the UVB range that the sunburn, but as Dr. Sheep mentioned, the UVA still goes in, so if you want to do it to look younger, not to get the brown spots, the freckles, then yes, use the sun bar, even in the winter time, because you know what? You're not getting any vitamin D yeah. from that sun anyway, you will need supplementation. Okay. Yes. We, we had a question in the back, so after we had a lot of sun exposures, we tend to get those uh, spots. Yes. So people require if you can do something about it? So it depends on the spots that you have. You can have white spots, you can have brown spots, brown. you can have eight, uh, freckles, you can have seborrheic keratosis that happens. Uh, some of them think it's the sun, but even it can be not related to sun. And you can treat with anything from uh, sprays to uh, creams to lasers. Um, you know, you can surgically remove them. There's a lot of different stuff. They can bleach them with the lemon, you know, over the counter treatments people use, a little bit lemon. I won't use lime and then go in the sun, like Dr. Ship said. That's a like guarantee that you'll get a little burn. There was an information, I don't know where I read it, but I was told that there is the least amount of uh, unhealthy ray from the sun. It's in the morning and at night, and the noon at the most is the safest part of the day to get the sun. That is true. The noon, because the sun is vertical. From you. So, so if you if you look at the at the, at the first slide that we did, uh, you, you 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 definitely during the middle of the day you'll get more of the uh, UV radiation. So I would not uh, I would not do that. The one percent that you have is the radio waves, the X rays that still penetrate our, our Earth also, about 1% microwaves, Th those things, um, you know, would be when the sun is the strongest. So if the morning and night is safer. 
Oh, so. Yeah, I'm not aware of that other thing. It doesn't make sense to me. Does it make sense to you? No. Yeah, they say 10 to 40 better stay or out. Indoors. I mean, you don't, I, I don't stay necessarily indoors, but I don't try and, try and to test try my... Too much. Yeah. But I had a skin cancer and I'm still going and having fun outside. Yeah. So skin cancer doesn't mean that you, that's it. You know, you're, you should not enjoy and you have, as I was saying at the beginning, you have to get the balance, the yin and yang of, of the sun. It's not meaning that we're saying sun is no good. It just means that you need to find for yourself what's the safe and the best way to get the best of the sun and prevent the worst. I want to ask about the cream you show, because I never saw this kind of cream in the store. Explain to us, there is special cream and you have to go to some kind of special store or doctor have to give prescription, because I'm interested in case I will make it. Regular cream, I have a, they have everywhere, and I usually buy, but this I never saw in the store. So there are a lot of companies uh, working with sun uh, blocks, and sunscreens, mm -hmm. and some of them only sell to physicians. Uh, so we have to go so, through the doctor. So some of them you may need to go just through the physicians, right? Okay. Some of them you can buy on Amazon or online. It's it's hard to tell which ones are available. Mm -hmm. But this one goes from Amazon or strictly from you or from doctor? Yeah, this is we can you can get at our office. I went I went specifically uh, to a conference with Dr. Sheep, and we got specific that because that's what we liked. The children, Thank what's you. the amount of time to do to have like some tiny equal to be honest? Same rules apply. Mm -hmm. 15 minutes before you go outdoors, every two hours back. I do no, that no, I'm not talking about uh, to, to be exposed to the sun, not to do. I understood about yeah. applying the sunscreen, mm -hmm. but what's the recommendation for children to be under the sun? You mean getting a little bit of the positive sun? Like, yeah, like yeah, like like sun tanning. What would you do for your kids? I let my little guy out. I still keep him with protection while he's outside. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. With the protection. protection. Yeah, with the protection, we're outside for we go outside for a long period of time. Um, in the summertime, sometimes we're out there for four hours. You know, give him water. We apply the um, sunscreen, like I said, in intervals of two hours. We have a great time. I don't tell my son we can't limit the sun. We just have to make sure we keep ourselves protected if we're out in the sun. So what he, I think what you're asking though is in terms of getting the healthy benefit of the sun. So the, the sunblock that you're using will only protect mostly in the UVB and in the UVA uh, 2 range, if you remember the division that Dr. Ship was talking about. So not so much in the UVA 1 or in the visible or infrared, which are helpful for other things. So you'll still get the healthy sun if you use the sunblock, maybe less if you use the clothing. But if you use the sun, like you still get the healthy rays. So definitely safer after four o'clock, depending on the time of the year. Definitely safer before ten o'clock. So I think especially during the summer. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So yeah, I see when I go to Brighton Beach, I see a lot of people leaving after ten o'clock, and I'm so impressed by them. Doc, you're coming, and it's ten o'clock. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> but but you know, I need to go with the family when they wake up. But. Yeah, you, you go and you just use a sound if you go after 10 o'clock. But if you come and you leave before 10 o'clock, good job for you. So for the kids, use the sound block, use the shirts, and, and do give them a little bit a little bit light. Maybe give them 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes. So instead of reapplying it in every two hours, I think with a physical blocker, you can reapply it a little longer. Don't, don't quote me that, but maybe four hours. <laughs> maybe even maybe in less. I personally use the physical blocker once, unless I sweat, because as as Sergey said, he found this physical blocker was sticking. So it's almost like putting a shirt on. Um, unless I sweat and I wash it off, it still stays. There. So I just apply it one time, and I'm usually good with that. How about vitamin D? You have to in the summer uh, the same amount if you have a lower level. Not lower than the normal, but the lower level. You have to get the artificial D. So uh, I'll 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 tell you I'll tell you my thought and I'll have Dr. Sheep answer also. He's very knowledgeable in that. Uh -huh. uh, now it's complicated. Uh, lot of I agree. So this. so uh, in everything you have to find the balance, the right balance for you. And vitamin D is important because it helps us with our bones. It also helps our immune system to fight a variety of cancers and colds. So that's one of the reasons why people think that during the winter time you get more colds because you're low on the vitamin D. Uh, 
I think that you should take supplementation, but you should uh, make sure that your body also is not absorbing too much of it because I've seen side effects from an exorbitant amount of vitamin D. There was one patient who came and he was taking uh, a physician, taking a lot of vitamin D because he was told he's low on it and he developed side effects. There will be joint pains, he was unable to walk and, and so you can get worsening uh, from too much vitamin D. So there is the yin yang in everything. There is a balance that you have to find. But if you take about uh, three to 4,000 international units per day, that is a good number. You can never overdose if you get it naturally through the sun. But if you supplement through a pill, you can get an overdose. So if you get the prescription pill, which is the 50,000 international units, you take it once a week, for example, you only yes, take it for... You, you only once take it, a day, and then they gave me once a week. That's the 50,000. Yeah. That's the 50,000. Yeah. If you do that continuously for six months, and you absorb it all, you're likely to be overdosing. Oh, so I should discontinue after few You need to test yourself and talk to your doctor. Uh -huh. Everybody's different, their absorption is different, other medication you may be taking, you know. Yes. So, but 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, definitely 4,000 is safe to, 3,000, no? 50,000, 3,000 a day is a safe dose to take. And how the contradiction cuts your with vitamin D? Mm -hmm. Now is another like story that it, it's going to the heart attack. Mm -hmm. Right. So so again, everything uh, got to be a yin and yang, and, and you need to find the balance. And you're taking a lot of other medications, and you're getting calcium through other foods as well. So you need to make sure that you don't overdose, and your kidneys are functioning well. So you're not, you know, you, you're not absorbing too much, but why, why don't you... Why don't I you agree with you saying, but there's not much more to add from that standpoint. I think everything you said was correct. Uh, so, yeah, I agree. Nothing more to add to that. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming in. Thank you. Oh, thank you.